Good morning, guys, and welcome out to Revolution. We are going to continue our Texas Receptor study into Matthew chapter 1. And so um, we spent about five episodes going through Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, which I knew would happen because of the concept of generation or genealogy. Um, and so then we went through um, in our last video, which was, I think, about eight months ago on this topic. Um, we went through uh, Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 2, all the way down to um, verse 6. And so um, I really do enjoy doing these studies. But one thing is uh, you can get bogged down in genealogies. And so um, some of these genealogies... Uh, they can be quite um, tedious to go through. Um, but I just thought, well, instead of me actually just stopping there, what I'll do is I'll go through from, um, actually, we went to verse 6, yeah. So we uh, this time we're going to go through, through from verse 7 to verse 17. That way we're done with the genealogies and then we can continue on in the narrative. Now, one thing I have forgotten to do is to share this to Facebook. So usually I share, um, now one thing I have forgotten to do, usually I share this to the Texas Receptus Academy uh, and a whole bunch of other places. Now, when I do eschatology videos, I don't share it to the TR Academy because I don't want to break my own rules. And um, when there's something off topic, which like eschatology isn't talking about bibliology, um, I, don't, I don't like to clutter up a page with just, um, stuff. Now, other pages that I run, like Texas Receptors pages and things like that, I do share things around there. Um, but most of the time when I do an eschatology um, video, I don't share it on my bibliology pages at all. And so um, I'm going to go to the TR Academy um, because a lot of people do frequent that group. And I should have done this before I went live, but um, just bear with me for a, a moment. I'll just post a few things, share a few things around. Now, I run over 50 Facebook groups, and so this comes in handy if you want people to know what you're doing, but um, it is a lot of work uh, policing that type of thing. So let's share this to a page. Um Texas Receptus, and I'll probably share this to my normal Facebook as well. Okay, so Nick Sayers. I think that'll do for the moment, and I'll just share a few things around later. So we've got Helg in the house. He says three thumbs up for the continuation of the TR study. Yeah, I've really wanted to get back into the Texas Receptor study. Um, I've put this off for quite a long time, been involved in a whole bunch of other things, been very busy, but I do enjoy going through this. And I, I learn a lot myself um, just in preparation for this. And when I'm halfway through a live stream, oftentimes I'm getting understanding, getting revelation. So let's just start reading through this. Okay, so we're looking at the 1611. Now I'll enlarge in this for us so that we can have a really good look. So we'll go through from uh, verse 7 here. It says, And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. And Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Isaiah, and Isaiah begat jo Joatham, and Joatham begat Ahaz and Ahaz beget Ezekias. And Ezekias beget Manassas. And Manassas beget Amon. And Amon beget Josias. And Josias beget Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias beget Salathiel. And Salathiel beget Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel beget Abiud. And Abiud beget Eliakim. And Eliakim beget Azor. And Azor beget Sadok. And Sadok beget Achim, and Achim beget Eliud, and Eliud beget Eleazar, and Eleazar beget Matthan, and Matthan beget Jacob. And Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. 
So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So I'll just check for the footnotes. So there's just a few uh, marginal notes here in the King James that talk about uh, referencing. But here we do have uh, Josiah spaghetti Jeconias. And so it has here, some read Josiah spaghetti yet Jacob, or Josiah spaghetti Jacob, and Jacob begat Jeconias. Okay, so we're going to look at that uh, in depth. So I just sort of mentioned that that is there as a marginal note. Now, um, this will show you why we prefer the King James over the Geneva Bible, over the Bishop's Bible, because the Bishop's Bible actually has this reading. Now, do you want to read a Bible with extra people in the genealogy? I don't. Uh, I want to read a Bible that has cleaned up those issues. Um, we think the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, those earlier Texas Receptus based Bibles were very good, but um, they are not perfect. Like the King James is perfect in its reading here. And so that's the one that we follow. So um, let's jump over to the Texas Receptus uh, site. This is the one that I run. And so we will go through Matthew 1, 7, and we will uh, examine the Greek and we'll see if there's anything written here. Um, that will uh, show us um, any, that will shed some light upon this text. And so I've got a little bit written here. And, and sometimes I forget how much I've written on each one of these pages. Sometimes there's hardly anything. Sometimes there is a lot. But let's just continue through this. So, uh, kata matheon. So, kata just means according to. Matheon just means um, Matthew. And so, sometimes it's spelt with two. Uh, tavs there, but this one has a tav and then a theta. That is usually how the Texas Receptus, that's usually how the Byzantine text has it. The critical text is usually has two, like say in Sinaiticus, it has the two T's there basically. So Solomon de Egenese ton Roboam, Roboam de Egenese ton Abia, Abia de Egenese ton Asa. Okay, so that would just be interpreted. Uh, and Solomon beget Reboam, and Reboam beget Abia, and Abia beget Asa. Okay. So the tw uh, 2023 edition, and Solomon beget Re Rehoboam, Rehoboam beget Abia, and Abia beget Asa. So one of the uh, reasons why in the 2023 edition it has uh, some of these names are slightly different is because I have used a different methodology, which does tend to be... Um, what most modern Bibles do. Because in the King James, what you'll find is it won't say Jeremiah, it will say Jeremy. It won't say Noah, it will say N-O-E. So people say no or Noe or they don't know how to pronounce it. And so I've just um, followed uh, modern um, classifications of names and, um, and in a sense, uh, tidy those things up where there are two places where Jesus appears, but it's, it's talking about Joshua because the underlying Greek is just Jesus. But there are other places where the underlying Greek is identical, but we have uh, like Judas and Judah, uh, exactly the same Greek underlying, but the King James made that type of choice for that generation because um, there was enough um, misrepresentation in saying, like putting Judah, like the book of Jude, um, should that be called the book of Judas, you know? And so... Um, they chose to have Jude, they chose to have Judah, they chose to have Judas and, and have separate words. And so um, this has just been a continuation of that in some other words and trying to couple the way that names are written in the Old Testament with the New. And so that just seems to be a modern standard that most uh, Texas Receptus modern modernized editions like the New, New King James, MEV, um, the King James... 2000 i'm pretty sure they do the same thing in there um i might just have a quick look actually i'm not sure i think these guys might have kept the same names let's just let's just look at this one for an example um matthew 1 7 and solomon beget 
Rehoboam. Yeah, exactly what I've got. And so that's the KJV 2000. And so um, I remember I was in the Philippines in 2003 and I picked up tons of these uh, because at the time we were reading the New King James, but we started to find that there were errors in it. So we were looking for other alternatives. So I picked that one up and found a bunch of errors in that. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why I did what I did because I just kept defining errors in the TR editions. And I thought, well, surely someone can just you know, look at all of them, work out the errors and, you know, chop them out and have a good edition without those errors in it. And so that's what I've done. So let's look at this interlinear. Okay, so um, let's just look at what I've got written here. Amazingly, liberal textual critic Bruce Metzger claims that Matthew 1, 7 to 8, the original author made a mistake. So in that... Um, in his uh, commentary on the Bible, he believes that Matthew made a mistake. So this is quite amazing. So we've got Docky in the house. Um, so the King James Version says, and Solomon beget Reboam, and Reboam beget Abia, and Abia beget Asa. Okay, so Asa beget Jehoshaphat. Um, so that's the King James. So here we have in the ESV, and Solomon, the father of um, Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abiah, and Abiah, the father of Asaph. And then again in verse 8, and Asaph, the father. So notice it has the father of. Um, now, I was tempted to go that way probably in about 2013, like 10 years ago. I was looking at these things and going, okay, is that a better rendition of begot or begat? You know, we usually don't use those type of words. But then um, comes the whole concept of skipping generations. And when you have a grandfather or great-grandfather mentioned, oh, he's the father of this guy, is he? And so it, it doesn't make any sense. And so having that they begot them means that they are in the lineage of that person. It doesn't mean they're their actual father. So that's where um, somewhere some modern versions like the ESV, they make the mistake of having the father there. But we're looking at Asaph. Okay, so um, these different names, Asa, King James Version, versus Asaph in the ESV, are textual differences. They're not variation in spelling of the names. So sometimes we have it, you know, like Noah, N-O-A-H or N-O-E. We see that in the King James. This, is, this isn't just a variation in spelling. But these are totally different names that come from different Greek texts. The text followed by the ESV here in verses 7 and 8 and 10. So we're going to look at 10 as well with a different name. We've got um, Amos or Amon there. Uh, are wrong names. In 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, the Hebrew Scriptures and the corrupt LXX read the same. So we understand the LXX has a lot of corruptions, but sometimes it lines up with the Hebrew. And so we, we can say, okay, it's correct there. It's not mistaken. It's like the NIV. It's not wrong everywhere, you know. Asa was the son of Abia, um, and Amon was the son of Manasseh. So even the erroneous ESV tells you the truth in 1 Chronicles 3, 10 to 14. So this is what we find in these modern Bibles. Many times they actually contradict earlier readings. We even see this in the New King James. Sometimes you'll have a, a certain reading, um, might be in 2 Kings, and then you go to Chronicles where there's a, the same story but from a different light. And um, sometimes it's saying the, the exact opposite thing. And so instead of defeating a king, it's giving aid to a king, this type of thing. And so um, that's why we reject um, the New King James. That's why we, we reject the ESV, because we believe that these Bibles have internal inconsistencies. They have massive errors in them. The ESV followed the Westcott and Hort United Bible Society's uh, critical Greek text in these places where they have the wrong names. Um, there were at least uh, three men named Asaph and two named uh, Amos, but neither one of them is listed anywhere in the Bible as being in the lineage of Joseph. The majority of all Greek manuscripts, the Hebrew scriptures, Lambs's translation of the Syriac Peshitta, and even the so-called Greek Septuagint uh, read, as does the King James Bible, with Asa and Amon. 
the erroneous Asaph and Amos, so Amos is what's in verse 11, uh, I think, in, and verse 10, verse 10, 11. Uh, come from Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Instead of just recognizing that these are two of the most corrupt manuscripts in existence, they have chosen to go against all historical evidence to, to the contrary um, and have two people in the lineage of Joseph who simply don't belong there. Not even the New American Standard Bible, the NIV, the Holman Standard, the Voice, the Orthodox Jewish Bible of 2011, or even Dan Wallace's net version followed the United Bible Society, Nestle, Alarm Critical Greek text here that falsely reads Asaph and Amos, but went instead with the traditional text of the Reformation Bibles and the King James Bible, and they all correctly read Asa and Amon instead of the ESVs Asaph and Amos. Other perverted Bibles would be the previous um, Revised Standard Version, where they correctly have Asa in verses 7 and 8, but then footnote the Greek says Asaph, which is not true at all. Uh, only a very few corrupted manuscripts like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus read this way, uh, while the vast majority of, of them have them right. So when they're saying, okay, the Greek says this, they're going back to their critical um, text of Westcott and Hort and then to the Nestle uh, text. But the RSV then went with the false reading of Amos in verse 10 and the footnote, others read Amon. <laughs> so they're all over the place, you know. So you see with the with these translations, it's not just the underlying text that is corrupt. It is the way that these texts are translated. Then came along the new Revised Standard Version of 1989 and said so that Bart Ehrman actually worked on that. And it changed both names, Asaph and Amos. Just like the ESV uh, 2001 to 2011 has it, these are clearly textual errors. And even the New American Standard Bible, NIV, Holman, and Net translations uh, translators had enough sense to see that these are the wrong names. And they went back to the traditional Greek text in these two instances. And so I've just mentioned here that begat or begot. Uh, a genesee is translated as begat in the King James Version 2016 in the uh, 1900 and begot in the 2016, and that would be in the 2023 20, as well. From Middle English, begetten, uh, from Old English, begetten, uh, to get, to find, to acquire, to attain, to receive, to take, to seize, to happen, to beget. From Proto Germanic, begenta, to find, to seize. Equivalent to be plus get, cognate with old old Saxon, um, bigatan, to find, seize, old German, um, bigazen, to gain, to achieve, to win, to procure. Okay, so that's what I've got got in the commentary here. Now let's have a look at Bruce Metzger's own words. Um, it's a tiny bit blurry here, but. I'll just uh, quickly read through this. It says, uh, under Asaph, it is clear that the name Asaph is the earliest form um, of text preserved in the manuscripts. For the agreement of Alexandrian um, Aleph and B, or Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and other witnesses, F1, F13, uh, 700, and 1071, with Eastern versions, Coptic, Armenian, Ethiopic, and Geo. I'm not really sure what Geo is. Um, might be a, some sort of Gothic type of thing. And representatives of the Western texts, um, old Latin manuscripts, and D in Luke. Um, D is lacking uh, for this part of Matthew. Makes a strong combination. Um, furthermore, the tendencies a tendency of scribes observing that the name of the psalmist Asaph, um, CF, the titles of Psalm 50, uh, 73 and 83, was confused with that of Asa, the king of Judah, uh, 1 Kings 15, 9, would have been cor um, to correct the error, thus accounting for the prevalence of Asa in the later ecclesiastical text and its inclusion in the Textus Receptus. So what he's saying is, People would have seen it said Asaph, the correct reading in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and they went, hang on, there's 10 times that this genealogical list in the Old Testament doesn't has, have Asaph there, it has Asa. 
So the the um, orthodox um, uh, scribes changed it to Asa. Okay, so he's saying that they corrupted the text. And so the Texas Receptus has this mistake in it, but this mistake just is backed up by 10 genealogical lists in the Old Testament and by the LXX and by pr you know, pretty much everything. He's laid ev absolutely everything that he's got out here, which isn't much. Um, if we were to lay everything out here that we had, there would be 10 pages for, you know, sort of thing. It's pretty much everything else. So um, although most recent scholars are impressed by the overwhelming weight of textual evidence supporting Asaph, sorry, I think I just said Asaph and Asa, and I got them uh, a little bit confused there, but, oh, no, he's, he's talking about Asaph. Okay, so he's saying there's overwhelming support for this. Um Legrange demurs and in his commentary prints Asa as the text of Matthew. He declares, page five, that literary criticism is not able to admit that the author who could not have drawn up this list without consulting the Old Testament would have taken the name of a psalmist in place of a king of Judah. It is necessarily, therefore, to suppose that Asaph is a very ancient scribal error. So that's what I would think. That's what most TR people would think also. Since, however, the evangelist may have derived material for the genealogy, not from the Old Testament directly, but from subsequent genealogical lists in which the erroneous spelling occurred, the committee saw no reason to adopt what appears to be a scribal emendation in the text of Matthew. So in other words, they're saying that like the Q source sort of thing, that Matthew, instead of getting his genealogical list from the Old Testament, which is where you would find, you know, internal consistency, that's where you would see people going, okay, well, um, this matches up with Scripture, it matches up with, with what God said in the past. Uh, no, they're going to um, say that there was a list that Matthew was using that had a different genealogy than the Old Testament. And so this is very strange. It's very bizarre. Um, and this goes back to the old adage that the oldest, um, sorry, the, the hardest reading is the best. And so this is obviously the harder reading. It's very difficult, but they're, they're saying that that's the best reading. And so uh, it boggles my mind that these people would think that Matthew, and that they even usually go right out of their way to say Matthew was a Hebrew gospel, it's written to Jewish people. Now, can you imagine having a list of uh, presidents of the United States and you're you're talking to someone who's sort of, you know, they, they're beefing up as someone who um, is, you know, talking to the Hebrews. Like imagine someone who was saying they were a constitutional lawyer or, or a, an American historian and they couldn't get a basic list of presidents right. You know, they just added someone who wasn't even a president. It's like, well, why are you adding this person? You know, it's like they they put Mahatma Gandhi in there or something. It's like, well, why would you do that? And so, um, but they're saying, oh, Matthew had another list that had errors in it. And he used that. He didn't go back to the Old Testament. So instead of actually just admitting that the Texas Receptus has the correct reading, uh, that the Texas Receptus, um, the New Testament and the Old Testament are cohesive and have the same readings, they have to go with this different reading and they have to make up this story that um, there was a different list that Matthew went to that had errors in it. And so we're talking about the inspired word of God here. So did God inspire these words? Do you think God would inspire error? Do you think God would say to Matthew, hey, just, you know, get some other thing. Don't get the Old Testament, you know, just just grab any book off the shelf, you know, and yeah, it's got mistakes and it. just copy it down. That's fine. You know, no, God wouldn't do that. This is inspired by God. Even if it wasn't inspired by God, you would expect a Hebrew who is, these guys claim he was specifically talking to Hebrews. Uh, you would think that he would get a genealogical list correct. I mean, that's why they have these lists. They're quite important. He wouldn't just throw in a, a, a psalmist here. But then we see in verse 10, we see um, Amos. Uh, the textual evidence for the reading Amos, an error for Amon, the name of the king of Judah, is nearly the same of that uh, which reads Asaph in verses 7 and 8. 
Okay, so we see in the genealogy in, the genealogy in 1 uh, Chronicles chapter 3, verse 10, most Greek manuscripts read Asa, um, though 60 read Asab in antiquity. Uh, Josephus uses Asenos, um, although the Latin translation Asaph appears. So they're really scratching around for, for evidence for their point. Um, but clearly they've got these two names um, and they're saying that these two names are different and they, they should be different because Matthew had a different list. He had, um, and they're saying that's the correct list, even though it contradicts the Old Testament. That's how strange these people are. And if you were to read through this, your head would just spin around and then you would go, well, what does James White say? You know, you'd just, you'd be like on his program, like James White, what are you saying? He'd just be like, well, you know, we, the Erasmus was an idiot, you know, sort of thing. And so anyway, um, I think that gives you a good understanding of the concept of Asa and Asaph. Okay. So let's just have a look. Um, at some of these versions. So I'll enlarge in this. And so we can see where there is a textual issue where we see Asaph and Asa here. Um, and so we, when we look TR, TR, all these TR editions have Asa. Majority text, Byzantine majority text says Asa. Um, and so pretty much it's just the reading except for the Alexandrian corruptions. Okay. So let's just have a look at some of these versions. Now I won't really bother with the more modern editions like Green's and Julia Smith and all the others. I'm just going to go through from perhaps from Webster. Um, actually Webster is usually always identical with the King James anyway. So let's go through from bishops backwards. Okay. So the 1598 Bishop's Bible says Solomon begat Reboam, Reboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. Okay. Geneva Bible, um, 1560 and 1599 has, and Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. The Great Bible, 1539, Solomon begat Reboam, Reboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. Matthew's Bible, 1537, Solomon begat Reboam, Reboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. Coverdale Bible, um, and maybe what I should do instead of just repeating this, when they're the same, I'll just say they are the same. Wycliffe has Solomon beget Reboam, Reboam beget Abi Abias. Now, I think there's something missing there in Wycliffe's, but <laughs> sometimes it's just the verse numbering. You find it in the next verse. But he didn't have numbers, so that's actually probably a um, an era where people have put verses according to, you know, the Vulgate or something like that. Um, but we go right back to the Wessex Gospel of 1175. We have Asa there. Isn't that, that amazing? If you have the ESV with with this Asaph guy who's a psalmist, but we have Asa who's a king, and it's in the Wessex Gospel. Uh, it's an English majority text version. It's in all the Greek, you know, um, you know, TR editions, it's, uh, you know, but they want to change that. So we see in the Reformation, that's what they had. And I'm glad that we've got that reading today because it's the correct reading. So, um, all right, so we've looked at verse 7. Let's look at verse, or oh, actually we've got a little bit of a picture here. So this is just the 1546 uh, Stephanus, um Solomon the Egenison ton Roboam, Roboam the Egenison ton Abia, Abia the Egenison ton Asa. Now we see the Asa again. So this this is in Stephanus. He's 1546. So he did four editions 1546, 1549, 1550, and 1551. Okay, so I'll just see if there's anything else of importance here that we need to really look at. Um don't think so. That's about it. Okay, so let's go to verse 8. So we have the same issue, the Asa there. So I won't um, belabor that, but we'll just read this in the Greek and then go through that. So we have Asa the Egenesin ton Yosafat, 
Yos Yosafat, and see how it says you, there. It's actually pronounced there, like our the. Yosafat the Egenesenton Yoram, Yoram the Egenesenton Ozian. Um, so there is an issue here with Ozian and uh, with the next verse, which has Ozias. Okay, so what I might do, I might just um, go to this issue. So if I go to the TR page here, we'll just uh, quickly go through these as we're going. So these are some of the uh, issues that Scrivener's brought up in his 190 variations, um, showing the differences of where he departed from Beza's text. So here we have Matthew 1.8, and so it's Ozian, and the very next one is Ozia. So they're actually the same issue, but what I'll do is I'll just quickly show you what it is. So um, Scribner put them in the same category, 8 and 9. He has Ozian and Ozias, and so he says that it appears everywhere like that. Um, and so he has Ozias, Erasmus, Al, um, the Aldine, so Erasmus's editions, the Aldean edition of 1518, Beza's second, third, fourth, and fifth editions are all of his Greek editions. His first edition was actually a Latin edition in um, 1556, but it had a, a Greek commentary, Greek and Latin commentary. And so um, that's considered his first edition. His fifth edition is the 1598 that the King James translators used. So... Um, they're saying that uh, it should the breathing marks should be one way. You can see uh, if I zoom that in a little bit, um, breathing mark is that way when he, they're saying that it shouldn't be that way. Okay, so he's corrected these breathing marks. So instead of a smooth breathing, it has a, a rough breathing. And so we can see this in the text here. We can see that this is um, a rough breathing. So, Hazion, Hazius, okay. So you got the the H there. So in Beza's text, um, it's very hard to see uh, the direction of the commas there, but we will uh, do our best to um, assure you that that's why he has changed that because it says Ozion, okay. So here has Ozias. Oh, actually, yeah. So the difference is this, um, rough, rough breathing. So sorry, I was saying the rough breathing was when it was going the other way. It's actually, um, it's it's actually when the comma is that way. So I might have to zoom that in so you can see that. Now let's just go down. So we're fully splitting hairs here. Beza has a rough breathing. Okay, so that's a rough breathing. Before uh, Hosius, which Scribner changed into a smooth breathing, Ozius. So he's looked at the 1611 gone, oh, they've got a smooth breathing there. So um, the Greek should match up. And so he has amended his Greek text, or pretty much Beza's Greek text. He did all the hard work. He's amended Beza's Greek text and said, well, they sh that's what the King James translators did. So the only diff, uh, the only other difference in this variation is the full stop and the colon or semicolon, um, which is a point above the line. So, that, so, um, and then I've got written out there what Scrivener had. If we go through the the next one, it's exactly the same issue. Uh, Ozian or Ozius there. So it's just the difference between a rough breathing and a smooth breathing. So what do we do with that? Okay, so I'll just see if I've got any more information here. Yeah, so um, the difference is a diacritical mark. Beza has a rough breathing before Ozias, um, which Scrivener changed into a, a smooth breathing, Ozias. Uh, Scrivener changed his 1881 Greek New Testament to Ozias in this verse, as opposed to Beza's 1598 Greek, um, uh, Ozias. But he was in error to do so because it can easily be explained by the translator's second rule, which stated the name of the prophets and of the holy writers with the other names of the text to be retained as nigh as may be accordingly as they are vulgarly used. 
Okay, so if they call Jesus, um, you know, uh, Jesus, they don't go, oh, well, it's not a J, it's a, there should be Jesus or Yahoos or whatever. No, if the common person in England called, um, you know, Timothy, Timothy, that's how they translate it. But there was also a, a very popular Shakespearean play called Timotheos. So they actually use both for, the, for Timothy. But they don't call Paul Paulos, okay? They call him Paul because that was just stock standard for Paul, uh, for Paulos. And so how they were vulgarly used is how they were to be um written down in the 1611 so that's exactly what they did so this is really a non-issue so um basically i've shown you that to show that um having that smooth breathing or rough breathing is not really translatable um because the king james translators were going to translate the osios here as it was commonly used in england at the time so I think um, that shows us that some of these things that Scrivener did were a waste of time. Um, and he should have just kept it the way that Beza had it. Okay, so we see in the King James it has um, an Asa. So that's the that issue with Asa. The modern versions have Asaf, who was a psalmist, not a king. So this is a lineage of kings. So it should be pretty straightforward. But uh, according to the new versions, it's not straightforward and... Um, Matthew had a different list. And Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias. Um, so the 20, 23 has an Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Isaiah. And so sometimes you'll see the names seem like they're very, very different, but when you go and do a study, on where these names appear in the New Testament and in the Old Testament and um, making sure that they line up um, in all of these places. Oh, there's certainly really two places there in the scriptures in the New Testament where it appears. But when you go back, um, like there's certain people like uh, Ezekiel and uh, Hezekiah, and sometimes when you're reading through some of the um, older names, which are which are faithful to the Greek, but they are they were understandable in 1611. Some of these um, some of these names they were more understandable, but today, um, like we don't say Jesus for Joseph, we say Joseph, and so um, having those two places in um, the New Testament where it has you know Joseph or Joseph led them out of. Um, of the land of uh, Egypt, um, or jo sorry, Joseph led them into the promised land. Sorry. Joshua, <laughs> I'm saying Joseph. I was wondering where I'm getting it, getting it wrong. So Joshua, instead of, because the Greek is the same, Jesus is Joshua. Jesus is Jesus. And so the King James translator is 100% faithful to the Greek. Just went, okay, the words say Jesus in both places. But like I said, in other places, they have Judah, Judas, and Jude, but it's all the same Greek. But these were issues that they had to deal with with their generation. We've got different issues in this generation. And there are a lot of things that they tidied up in this generation. And because they tidied them up, we know they're no longer issues. But then you know, along come a bunch of other issues and people are like, oh, why have you got Jesus as um, Joshua? Why, why, why have you got Jesus written there in Hebrews and in the book of Acts? And, and you know, that becomes a, a point of contention because, you know, we, we think that, you know, Jesus or you should only use that name for one person. Just like in, um, in 1611, they thought they needed to separate some of these names for Judas. Because I guess, you know, people people like, oh, don't say Judas. But see, now you've got so many people named after Jesus. You've got, um, you know, in the Philippines, Mexico, different places, people named after Jesus. Um, and I guess back then you probably had um, more superstition. I mean, I know some people are reading uh, or some people name their kids <laughs> like 
you know, I know a, a good, really good couple, but they just didn't realize they, they named their um, kid Nero. And it's like Nero was a, the great persecutor of the Christians. You know what I mean? And it's like when you're in church and you go, Nero, you know, it's like, oh my God, what, you know, it's, you wouldn't usually call your kids you know, Judas or, uh, or, you know, I, I know another couple called their kid Cain. I'm like, well, why would you do that? You know, I, I just can't understand why that would be done. Um, but, you know, everyone, people can do whatever they want. It's just it's just a name at the end of the day. But, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, 400 years ago, calling your child that type of thing would have been very frowned upon in society. And so people were very careful about names like Judas and Judah and making sure you made, made the distinction that, oh, no, he wasn't the one who betrayed Jesus, you know, um, or you, you know, the book of Jude, it's not written by Judas, you know, and they, they had to be very careful with that. And so um, we find there are a few different problems that we have. We're more like, okay, well, yeah, or Jesus wasn't leading them into the promised land. Inadvertently he was, but it was, yeah, we understand that it's talking about um, Joseph. Not jo I keep saying Joseph. <laughs> it's just terrible. Joshua. Okay, so what have we got here? So um, Bruce Metzger claims, so I've got the same material there. So there's really not much to see here. I've got the 1546 again. Let's just have a quick look at it. Asa ve egenesen ton Yosafat, Yosafat ve egenesen ton Yoram, Yoram ve egenesen ton Ozian. And so here you can see the Ozian and Ozias there with the rough breathing. Okay. I'm just going to check and see if that's the rough breathing. Yeah, the rough one. Actually, no, that's the smooth breathing. So that would be the same as Scrivener, which is interesting. Anyway, I'll have to do a little bit more work on that because uh, when you're looking at one little point that's going one way or the other, it's like, um, and stopping in the middle to do that, it, it can be quite annoying. So let's just go back to, um, so we've gone through verse seven, we've gone through um, verse eight. So we looked at the asset issue in verses seven. Um, and we also looked at the Ozean Oz or Hosean or Ozias or Hosias in um, verses eight and nine. So let's just check out these older Bibles. We'll see what they're saying. So we look at the bishops, Asa beget Josephat, Josephat beget Joram, and Joram beget Ozias. So here we can see the difference, Hosias and Ozias. And so um, the Ozias won out. Okay. So people just started to use that name in England. So they went, let's just go with that. But you can see the old way of saying it, uh, Hosias. But then covered out Ozios, Ozios. And so it looks like Matthews was the one who said that. Um, I'm pretty sure Matthews might have used that from a German Bible. I'm pretty sure he went to Luther quite frequently. Um, but we can see that's where the Asif and Asa issue occurs as well. So, um, but we see in. Um, the Wessex Gospels, 11.75, it has Ozium. And we can see in the Wycliffe Bible, as usual, it just seems to have a mistake there. But what can you do? Okay. So Helg says in the Norwegian Bible, it reads Uzias, Uzia. Very interesting. Okay. So let's... Um, Let's go to uh, verse 9. Uh, Azias the Egenesenton um, Yoatham, Yoatham the Egenesenton Akaz, Akaz the Egenesenton Azikian. So the King James has an Ozias beget Joatham, and Joatham beget Akaz, and Akaz beget Azikias. So I've got an Uzziah beget Jotham, and Jotham beget Akaz, and Akaz beget Hezekiah. And so we would more so go Ezekiel. I was talking about Ezekiel, I guess, but having it uh, Hezekiah 
um, understanding that, doesn't that, um, I guess in a way, you know, I'm just trying to defend why I've done that. And I guess I'll you know, constantly do that because I do think that um, there are some things that just make sense to me uh, going through that. Neither are an error. It's just because um, English is fluid and continues to go throughout history and we can't change the way that um, uh, certain rules of um, syntax and uh, grammar uh, occur. So Matthew chapter 1 verse 9 here in Stephanus is 1546. So I'm not sure why I've just got the 1546. Usually it's not the most popular one, but uh, you can see here, Ozias the Egenesenton, Yoram, Yoatham, Yoatham the Egenesenton, Ahaz, Ahaz the Egenesenton, Ezekian, and then Ezekias there. Okay. So we're getting through this. Um, I will, maybe what I'll do, I'll go through this all the way through to verse 17, the way that I'm doing it now. And then I'll just sort of check back. Or maybe as I'm going, I'll see if there's any other issues. Um, okay, well, this is where we have the aim on issue, but we've sort of dealt with that. Uh, so it's only in verse 10. It doesn't go anywhere else. So... Um, Ezekiel the Egenesenton Manasse, Manasse the Egenesenton Amon, Amon the Egenesenton um, Yosean. Okay, and Ezekiel beget Manasses, and Manasses beget Amon, and um, Amon beget um, Josias. And Hezekiah beget Manasseh, and Manasseh beget Amon, and Amon beget Josiah. Um, I can't just see if there's anything here. No, the usual beget, begot thing. Um, I don't have anything but the 1598. You uh, just the Egenison Ton Fares. That's verse three, so that's wrong. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, and I've even got verse three written there, so I'll have to correct that. But it doesn't look like there's anything to talk about much there, so I'll just check verse eight and nine in these Bibles. So we have the Bishop's Bible has Hosios, where Geneva Bible has a H in front of that. Akaz with a Z in the Geneva, S in the Bishop's. Not much of a difference. Um, just seeing if anything stands out. Ezekiah in the Wessex 1175. It has okay, so let's continue to the next verse, verse 10, since we've already read it. Um, bishops Ezekiel begat Manasses, Manasses begat Amon, Amon begat Josias, pretty much identical to the Geneva. Looks pretty much the same. So not much to talk about there. So let's go to verse 11. So we have gone through verse 10, haven't we? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. So let's go through verse 11. Uh, Josias the Egenison ton Yekonayan, um, Kaitos Adelphos of Du, Epites Mek. Metocasius of Vavilonos. Um, and Josias, King James, um, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Uh, 2023 edition, and Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So I'll just check and see if there's any interesting information. Ah, this is where we have the Jakim issue. So we'll go through the Jacob issue. Um, okay, so that's uh, 12. I was just checking to see if there's anything there. It's a bit of a, a funny textual reading, but we'll get to those textual issues later. 
And verse 11, I'll just go read that in the TR Bibles. In the bishops, Josias beget Jacob. See, notice you got this Jacob here in the bishops' Bible. Who's that? It's not in the King James. So this Jacob twice and begat added. Okay. And Josias begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Jeconias and his brethren. So the Geneva Bible has that as well. So if you were to sit around um, before 1611 or before 1604 or Hampton Court Conference and say, well, yeah, the Bible, the Geneva Bible has errors in it, you could just point this out. This is usually when people say, oh, well, the Geneva Bible is just as good. I say, okay, so do you have Jacob as you're reading? And you ask them, do you do you want Jacob? And most people believe this is a genealogy of Jesus, not the genealogy of Joseph. They go, oh, it's a genealogy of Jesus. And I'm like, so are you willing to add another name to that genealogy? And they're like, oh, no. So usually that cures them from saying, you know, oh, we'll go to the Geneva or we'll go to the bishops. If you got this type of error, uh, you want that fixed. And so this is the thing. People did a brilliant job, but they there were just the odd spatterings of um, of words like this that entered in that people just need to, needed to get rid of. And see, when you read the earlier Bibles, um, Josiah spaghetti and Jeconias, they don't have Jacob in there. Now, where did Jacob come from? I'm pretty sure it was the uh, 1550 of Stephanus in, in a footnote, not in the main text, okay? So they follow the footnote. So Matthew's Bible just has Josiah spaghetti and Jeconias, um, covered our Bible, Josiah spaghetti and Jeconias and his brethren, Tyndale, the same. So it's just basically these two Bibles, which are pretty big hitters, the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible, but they had this um, strange reading in it. And so that's why I say, well, we need to avoid some of the readings in these Bibles. That is why they have the marginal note in the 1611. So I'll show you that marginal note. It has here, some read, Josiah begat Jacob and Jacob begat Jeconias. Why have they put that there? People are like, oh, these uh, marginal notes are just alternative readings. Uh, no, these marginal notes many times are to help people to get away from silly readings and to trust in the text that the King James translators have used. Also, you'll have a whole generation of people who are reading through Matthew chapter 1, and in their Bible, in people in the pew, they're holding a Bible or people going up to the front reading something. They might have been looking at uh, bishops or might have been looking at a Geneva Bible at home or wherever. And they're like, hang on. Oh, no, there's a print error here because um, you know, where's Jacob gone? You know, But um, the King James translators and the people who compiled that Bible wisely put this in to get rid of this concept so that people would look at it and say, okay, well, they obviously knew that these were extra words and they've dropped them off. Okay. And so let's have a look at what uh, Scribner uh, has to say about this. So um, Jacob added in Geneva and Bishop's Bibles, um, Frederick Henry Ambrose Scribner has in his 1545 work, a supplement to the authorized version in the New Testament, being a critical illustration of its more difficult passages from the Syriac Latin and early, earlier English editions with an introduction. The margin of the authorized version informs us that some read Josias and Jacob and Jacob begat Jeconias. The same note occurs in the margin of the of bishops and the words are found in the text of Geneva. Well, I think Scribner is actually wrong there. It's not just in the margin of the bishops. It's actually in the reading of the bishops. Um, I'm pretty sure maybe I've got a picture of that. Um, no, I don't. But that's something I will probably have to do later. Um, which deferred in this uh, manner to the judgment of Beza. And so... Um, See introduction, page 94, Mill, um, prologue, New Testament, page 130. Um, uh, Censures 
Beza for admitting um, Ton Yekim, uh, Yekim de Egenesen, into earlier editions of his Greek Greek Testament. Mill might have added that he afterwards became sensible of his error and retracted it in the edition of 1582. So it was in the, the earlier editions of Beza. Now, um, the words proposed to be inserted are certainly supported by some authority. Besides Codex um, Iota um, uh, Delta of, I'm just trying to think of what number that is, Codex 14, I think it is, of Stephen's uh, Grease Backs 120 of the Gospels and Colonnei's New Testament 1534, which misled Castellino and Beza. Nine other manuscripts have been cited in favour by Scholes. The same clause with the variation of Yakim, sorry, Yoakim for Yakim is found in about 25 other manuscripts, including several of respectable antiquity, as well as in the margin of the Philoexian, Philoxenian, <laughs> I, I can't say that properly, Syriac, and some copies of the Jerusalem Syriac version. In all other translations, the words are omitted. And this is the case in which the testimony of versions manifestly deserves to have considerable weight. The addition is unknown in all the fathers except Irenaeus, whose precise meaning is very doubtful, and Epiphanes, um, who has a particular a reading particular to himself. Hilary, on the contrary, points out the deficiency in the number of generations between the captivity of our Lord's birth. Um, Porphyry cavils it, uh, and Chrysostom resorts to the forged apology, and it's all in Greek there, which I won't bore you with because it looks very difficult to read with these um, funny ways of having theta almost as a ligature. Thus, the arguments for the spuriousness of the clause uh, decidedly um, preponderate. <laughs> I love these old school words. It's probably originated as a marginal gloss made by some person who adopted Jerome's explanation of the passage, namely that by Jeconias in verse 11, we ought to understand Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, and in verse 12, Jehoiachin, in the son of Jehoiakim, a view of the subject approved by Whitby, um, whether correct or otherwise, it is not uh, for me to inquire. Um, Syriac Vulgate Tyndale says, Gov, Cran, um, here resemble the received Greek text. Um, and then he's got a Latin quote. It is the well-known rule of Jerome in this point. Okay, so that's by Scrivener. So here we see the English Bibles. So we can see it has Josiah Spaghetti, uh, Jeconias, all the way through from Wycliffe, uh, Tyndale, Coverdale, Great Bible, Matthews. Then we see in the Geneva Bible, Josiah Spaghetti, Jacob, and Jacob begat Jeconias, Geneva Bible. And then we see in the, um, eight years later in the Bishop's Bible, um, Josias begat Jacob, Jacob begat Jeconias in the bishops. So then it was reverted back in the King James correctly. Okay. So um, another thing we see here is um, Codex Purpurius uh, Rosanesis. <laughs> uh, love these names. Um, it is the additional reading of Ton. Uh, Yoakim, Yoakim, the Egenesen, Yoakim, Yoakim begot. So we can see those manuscripts there. So you can just go to my website. I'll put that in the comments there if anyone wants to look up some of those manuscripts or whatever, if they uh, want to study that further. But then we have the issue of cursed Jehoiakim. Okay, so when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that he had... Um, burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying take thee again another roll and write it in 
all the former words that were in the first roll, which um, Jehoiakim, the father of Judah, hath burned. And thou shalt say to uh, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall sh certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. Therefore, thus says the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the street, sorry, in, cast out in the day to the heat and in the night uh, to the frost, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearkened not. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, and wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And there were added beside unto them many like words so it's interesting here it says and i will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity um it says um he shall have none to sit upon the throne of david so none of his lineage will ever sit upon the throne of david but the crazy thing is he is in if you read through the bible Matthew chapter 1, if you read the modern versions, including the New King James, it says it's the genealogy of Jesus. Now, who's sitting on the on the throne of David right now? It's Jesus Christ. That's why it's a, it's a translational error to have this as the book of the genealogy of Jesus. It's the book of the generation of Jesus. It's a huge difference. The generation, it's talking about this is what Jesus Christ generated. This is what Jesus made. He made the church. He did miracles. He did healings. He rose the dead. He did lots of different things. Um, he rebuked people. He preached. And then he ascended up into heaven. He died. He, he was buried. That's what it means. This is the book of the generation. This is the book all about what Jesus generated. This is the book of what Jesus did. Okay, instead of this is the genealogical list of Jesus. It's not. It's a genealogical list of Jesus' stepfather to show that it had um, Jehoiakim in it and to show that he was cursed. Now, uh, I'm just a bit convicted now that I've said always said that it's Jeconiah that was cursed, which is uh, I always get these names wrong. I think I use Jeconiah so frequently in the Jehoiakim, Jehoshaphat, you know, explaining Jehovah that sometimes I get these names mixed up. But it's Jehoiakim. He was told that no one from his lineage would ever sit on the throne of David. So this is to prove in Matthew chapter 1 that verse 1 is just, it's just a standalone verse. The, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, he's the son of David. He's on the throne of David. He can't be if it's his lineage the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, so he's Jewish and he's related to David and he is sitting on the throne of David now. Then the next verse goes, okay, so let's go through this genealogical list all the way through to Joseph, the stepfather, not to Jesus. Joseph was not related to Jesus. This, this genealogy is to show that, to prove that. It's like you go through and it's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's got um, these, this person in it, so no one could sit on the throne of David from him onwards. Okay, so that cancels Jesus out. Exactly, that's the point. Then it goes into the virgin birth. It's like, well, I know you guys are thinking, well, um, wasn't Jesus' father, didn't he have, wasn't he related to Jehoiakim? Exactly. That's why it's a virgin birth, because they knew he was the Messiah. It's not like this is convincing people that he's the Messiah. They knew he was the Messiah because of what he did and everything like that. And they were just like, oh, what about this? He, wasn't that his real dad? It's like, no, it wasn't. He had a virgin birth. Like, oh, wow. So um, that changes. That, that's why there's so many errors in the modern versions. In, in Matthew chapter 1, 1. And that's why I go on about it quite 
frequently because it just destroys 17 verses. Soon as you open the New Testament, you're just like an error. The, the second word of the New Testament comes against the virgin birth. It makes Jesus cursed. <laughs> I mean, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, so this proves that the genealogy from Matthew 1, 2 is of Joseph and not as the New King James and other Bibles say of Jesus. So we've got to be very careful about that. <clears throat> okay, so I don't have that much else here. And just I speak at Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Okay, so I think, did I read verse 11 here? I did. Okay, so I don't need verse 8 up anymore. Verse 11. So we have um, so some different Greek words here. Uh, kai, tois, adelphoi. So we have, um, like, we know the words like, or the city of Philadelphia, brotherly, adelphos, uh, kindness, um, filio. So we have adelphois here, which means brethren or brothers. Um, Aftu, it means his uh, epites metoi, metoi kesias, uh, that means they're carried away, metoi Epi usually means on top of. Um, and so about the time, um, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So an interesting... Uh, look at that. Actually, I know that the the guys from Daily Dose of Greek, they have actually done some videos. This would be an interesting one to look at. I'll just quickly see if I can do this. Sorry to rabbit trail, but um, Daily Dose of Greek. Okay, here they are. They're just... Okay, so Matthew, Matthew 1, there's number 11. Now, I've just got to check and see if this is copyright or not, because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to just move away, or it doesn't say it's copyrighted. So anyway, let's just go through this. Matthew 1, 11. Yosias de Egenesen ton Yekonian, Kaitus Adelphus Autu. So he's using the modern Erasmian, Kaitus Adelphus Autu, where I would say, um, Yekonias de Egenesen ton Yekonian, Kaitus Adelphus Autu. And so when he says Autu, the Greek modern Greek pronunciation is like an F of two. Epites metoikesias. Epites metoikesias Babylonos. So even Babylonos would be with a V sound, Babylonos. Continue now with the genealogy of Messiah Jesus. We read, and Josiah begat or fathered Jeconiah. And then. Okay this interesting addition and the brothers of him right and his brothers this is actually quite debated is this literal biological brothers of jeconiah or is this intending uh is this intended for the reader to just think of the broader jewish nation it whatever the, whatever the author intended it's clear that he's wanting us to back up and see a broader picture right this is not just a singular line of individuals in a genealogy but we're reminded repeatedly with glances off to the side that there is the broader nation right there is there is the whole nation of israel and god's promises are uh, often fulfilled to them through a, a singular royal figure right fulfilling um, certain times of deliverance and ultimately in the messiah so let's pick back up here, right? And let's remind ourselves we're right here. And Josiah begat Jeconiah, 
and the brothers of him and his brothers. And then we have this epi, which can mean on, upon, at, and here it's referring to. Okay, so epi means on, upon. So we'd see epi in, say, Matthew 24, where it says uh, ethnos, epi, ethnos, nation against nation. So it can mean against or on top of. Um, and so I might just grab a... Um, <clears throat> I don't like Pinterest because usually I click a button and then it wants me to do something, <laughs> you know, buy something or. Okay, so here we see. Um, wow, that looks like a really good one, actually. Okay. But it's in a different language. Sorry to if you're listening. I'm just looking at some of the diagrams that show. Um, yeah, this looks okay to look at. Okay, so we have. I'll just enlarge in it. So peri means around. We might use like periscope or periphery or pros is towards. Ek is out of. N is in. Dia is through. It can also be by. Um, and so it doesn't actually have epi. Oh, yeah, epi, upon. So where is epi here? It doesn't actually have epi, which is a little bit annoying because that's the only one that I wanted to look at. It looked like it was out of that picture. Um, let's go back to a, an easier one. Okay, so epi is on top of, upon. Okay, so when we have ethnos, epi, ethnos, it's nation against nation. Okay, so, but here, epi is something very different. Um, so it can be on the basis of, or on, or to, or against. And so I guess nation against nation, we've seen that. But here we have on the basis of. So, um that's what it would mean here when it's saying, um, we'll just go back to the video. When it's saying on the basis of um, the carrying away to Babylon. So um, uh, Uzziah um, begot um, Yekonias and his brethren um, about the time. So uh, of the carrying away of uh, to Babylon. So it's interesting, but let's just continue with the Greek daily dose. Specific time. So we might say at the time of or upon the deportation of Babylon. That is upon the occasion of the deportation or the exile into Babylon. And so we have the genealogy broken up here with a reference to God's disciplinary judgment on the southern kingdom. Uh, as they rebelled against him, he allowed the uh, he allowed Babylon to conquer them and to carry them off into exile. This word exile or deportation, the lexical form is metoi kesia, metoi kesia. You can see that, that that idea of house right there or dwelling. You know. It's like the oikonomia sort of thing. Or oikos in Greek means a house. So that's where we get um, words like... Um, economy even or um oikos what's that word english word that's related to uh oikos anyway it'll come you know the word oikos or oikia and so this is a forced change of habitation as one of the common as one of the lexicon says an exile captivity forced removal to another place of habitation this word only occurs four times in the new testament once here in verse 11 once in verse 12 and two times in verse 17. okay so that was good um i won't go through the rest of these unless we feel that there's a place where we really want to stop um 
but I'll keep that open. And so um, got some heaps of comments coming in here um, at the Babylon Babylonian removal, Young's literal translation, uh, Matthew 11b. Um, good to see you on tonight and back on the TR study. Hi, King James Bible Sunday School. Welcome to the program. Helg says about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Um, so they were carried away. Yeah, it's interesting about the time they carried away to Babylon. Uh, epi is sometimes used of time. Yeah, it's very interesting. Interesting word. Um, maybe a broader time and era. Okay, yeah, about that era they were taken away. Okay. Um, epi with the genitive. Okay, yes. Yeah, thanks for that info. And so... Um, Here's another chart. Greek roots diagram. Hooper, above, beyond. Epi, on, at, or together with. Peri, pros, ice, into. Hoopo, underneath. Yeah, so these are very good charts to have. Um, there's... One, I think I saw it on Pinterest here, where it has the mice. Um, Pinterest actually has some really good pictures. I just don't, sometimes you look at two or three of them and then it's like, sign up, you know, you you feel like you're in trouble. This one with the mice coming in and out. Um, so epi upon um, anti, it's against. N is in, the mouse is in the cheese. Ek, it's coming out of. Ice, it's going into. Um, so you might look at your know, exegesis and eisegesis, you know, there. So, you know, it's very interesting. Having a picture like that um, probably on your office wall would be very helpful if you are learning uh, Greek. Um, so you can just, you know, whenever you get stuck, you just have a look and go, oh, that's right, you know. Para, like a parable, it's beside um, pros towards dia through. Um, very interesting. Okay, so I think we've exhausted that verse. Let's go to verse 12. Um, meta there, um, 10. Metacasian, Vavilonos, Yekonias, Egenesen ton, Salathiel, Salathiel, Egenesen, Egenese ton, Zarababel. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias beget Salathiel, and Salathiel beget Zarababel. Sorry. And after they were brought to Babylon in the KJV 2023, Jeconias uh, beget Salathiel, and Salathiel beget Zarababel. Let's see if there's any more info down here uh the corrupted codex vaticanus has the clumsy reading of gena here also in matthew 113 um codex sang golensis 48 reads zorum babel zorum bababel for zorobabel okay just a Bit of a um, bit of an error there. So let's just quickly look at verse twelve and see if there's much of a difference. Doesn't look like there's any textual issues there. So in the bishops, it has and they were brought to Babylon. Whoops. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begets Salathiel, and Salathiel begets Zerubbabel. So the Geneva has they were carried away into Babylon, which is the same as the King James, I think. Brought to Babylon. No, sorry. Brought to Babylon. Um, yes, yeah, so Geneva has the carried away into Babylon. Jeconias, but yet Slathiel, same thing. Uh, Great Bible has brought to Babylon. Matthew's brought to Babylon. Coverdale Bible has an after the captivity of Babylon. Tinder has an after they were brought to Babylon. 
um, Wycliffe in his 1382 has an after the transmigration of Babylon and the Wessex gospel has and after Babin, Babylonius Gellior, I can't read that. <laughs> That's a very, very old word that I cannot read. Okay. So um, there's not much to see in verse 12. So I think we'll just continue on from there. Verse 13. Zerubbabel the Aginesin ton Abiyud, Abiyud the Aginesin ton Elihim, Elihim the Aginesin ton Azor. The King James says, and Zerubbabel begat Abiyod, and Abiyod begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor. The 2023 says, and Zerubbabel begat Abiyod, and Abiyod begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor. We'll just see if there's any issues on the website. Matthew 1.13 is the 13th verse of Matthew 1 in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. The verse is part of a section where the genealogy of Joseph, the father of Jesus, is listed. This verse covers the section... Um, somewhat after the Babylonian captivity, six generations before Jesus. The corrupt Codex Vaticanus has the clumsy reading of Gena here, also in verse 12. Okay, so the same type of information there. So let's just see what these older Bibles have. Um, the Bishop's Bible has, and uh, or doesn't have and, it just says, Zerubbabel, we get Abiyod, Abiyod beget Eliakim, Eliakim beget Azor. So Geneva Bible has and um, Zerubbabel, which is more correct because the King James does have the and there. It's the there that's in the Greek. And so we see here there is a textual issue. Um, Eliakim or Eliakim, just one letter. The the um, epsilon is uh, is added there. But it's not a big deal. It's just it's a difference between the Texas Receptus and the Byzantine majority text. So um, not much of a issue. Just the way that something sounded, and you know, as if they had Google or you know, dictionaries <laughs> back then. Um, so we see it's reading pretty much the same all the way through. So that's not really something that we have to worry about. Um, Okay, so let's go to verse 14. Um, Azor the Egenesenton Sadok, Sadok the Egenesenton Achim, Achim the Egenesenton Eliud. King James and Azor beget Sadok, and Sadok beget Achim, and Achim beget Eliud. Um, 2023 says, and Azor beget Zadok, and Zadok beget Achim, and Achim beget Eliud. Um, nothing in the commentary there. And so we'll just go to the older Bibles and have a quick look. Bishop's Bible, Azel begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliot. Now, I'm saying and there because there should be an and, um, and that's where I guess the Geneva Bible, you can see where the Geneva Bible is closer here to the King James having the ands. Now, sometimes having an and... Um, you, you don't need it, but I think where there are so many, um, uh, so many that, uh, as we can see here, uh, there, 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 and that's the and, and so it's uh, basically saying Azor and begot, but we usually put the and in front, so and Azor begot. But that's exactly how the King James reads. And so we see that the Bishop's Bible didn't have those ands there. But the Geneva Bible does. Great Bible didn't either. Matthews, Coverdale, Tyndale, Wycliffe, none of them had the ands there either. But um, the King James is a little bit more faithful to the Greek, I feel, there. And so sometimes, too, it can depend if you're talking about certain um, like if you're talking about three things, um, you have black, white, and purple, where in the Greek it might have black and white and purple, where we would yeah, definitely use the Oxford comma there and, and make a distinction between those things. Okay, so that's verse 15. Let's go to verse 16. 
Um, Eliud the Egenesin ton Eliezer, Eliezer the Egenesin ton Matthan, Matthan the Egenesin ton Yaakov. Now I know that that Egenesin, that Nu is an error. It's not supposed to be there. And Eliud, King James, and Eliud beget Eliezer, and Eliezer beget Matthan, and Matthan beget Jacob. Uh, 2023 says, and Eliud beget Eliezer, and Eliezer beget Matthan, and Matthan beget Jacob. Let's have a quick look at these older ones. Matthew 1, 15. Bishop's Bible, Eliud beget Eliezer, Eliezer beget Matthan, Matthan beget Jacob. Geneva, and Eliud beget Eliezer, and uh, Eliezer beget Matthan, and Matthan beget Jacob. It's much smoother with the ends there. I don't know why. I guess because I'm just used to the King James. Uh, and none of the others have the ends there, but they're all pretty much the same. Okay, so there's not much controversy with those ones. Verse 16. Yaakov the Egenesin ton Yosef ton Andra Marias ek eis egenethe Jesus holegomenos Christos. So that's the Greek of Beza. The King James says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Um, in the 2023, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So it's absolutely identical there. That's pretty cool. Um, so we might listen to um verse 16 actually i don't think they've done it i think it comes out tomorrow so i'll just have a quick look on their web page no they've done it here it is Matthew 1 16 Jacob de Egenesen ton Yosef ton Andra Marias ex heis Egenethe Jesus Hallegomenos Christos. Here we have arrived at Messiah Jesus, the one to whom all this genealogy has been building. Right? We began the book, the record of the genealogy of Messiah Jesus, of Christ Jesus. So most people will say that this is the genealogy of Jesus. But instead of ending there, it ends at Joseph. And then it goes, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. It doesn't say the father of Jesus. You know, so that they just go through that and go to Jesus. It destroys the virgin birth. It's just, it's a clumsy way of doing it. Um, but anyway, let's continue. Son of David, son of Abraham, and now we have arrived. We finish here in this last uh, last section. And Jacob, this is the adoptive grandfather of Jesus through Joseph. And Jacob beget Joseph. And then notice it doesn't say, and Joseph beget Jesus. Ah, that's not what happened, right? Jesus was conceived. We're going to get more detail on this later, but Jesus was. So that's why we wouldn't say it's a genealogy of Jesus. It's a genealogy of Joseph conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But we read here, Joseph, who is he? Well, here's an appositional restatement. He is the husband, the, the man, but within context, the word on air here, meaning husband, the husband of Mary, genitive of relationship, from whom, there's a relative pronoun that's referring back to Mary. It's feminine and singular, of course, because it's referring back to Mary, out of whom, from whom Jesus was born. This verb here, Wesley Olmsted in his Baylor handbook reminds us this is the 40th time that we've seen the verb genao, but this form is different, right? Because the birth of Jesus is different from the birth of everyone else that came before. Here we have an augment, we have a theta. When you see that theta, it's like a big recliner, like an easy chair. Somebody's kicking back and feeling passive. Yes, this is an aorist passive indicative, and it's third person singular because the subject is the third singular Jesus. Jesus was born from her. And, and then we have this appositional restatement. Who is Jesus? He is the one called, that's a passive participle from Lego, the one being called Christ. Okay. Well, that was pretty good. Um, so, 
Yaakov the Agenese ton Yosef ton Andra Marias, the husband of Mary, ek ace out of Egenethe, Jesus ho legomenos Christos, legomenos, uh, who is called, labeled, um, hologomenos. You hear that every now and then. I might actually just grab those words. For a quick search. Yeah, who is called Peter, hologomenos, Petros, um, Name Judas, Hologomenos, Judas, um, which mean or which is to say place of a skull, Hologomenos, Hologomenos, Barabbas. There was one named Barabbas, Hologomenos, Judas, Hologomenos, Christos, who was called Christ. So, yeah, it, it is a common thing, or well, it looks like it, that Logomenos appears 12 times. Um, so here we have um, in Jacob, we get Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And so I, I am going to go to verse 17 in this study. And then we're just going to sort of look over that uh, section just to make sure that we've covered everything. But I do want to probably next study, I do want to look at Joseph and also Mary. Um, because there is um, Joseph Olatry and Mary Olatry. So we want to look at these aberrations that have occurred throughout history. We want to look at who the true Joseph and Mary are and who the historical, um, pseudo-historical Joseph and Mary are, um, according to usually the Roman Catholics. But there are a few other breakaway groups that um, have an overemphasis on Mary. We see the um, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and many of the Orthodox groups um, they um, show Mary um, an undue amount of fascination. And so um, they think that they can ta all talk to Mary at the same time. Uh, and I usually say, well, Mary's dead. She's probably going to you know, meet us at the rapture. But at the end of the day, Mary, um, she cannot hear your prayers. Uh, because she's dead. But even if she was alive, how could she hear everyone's prayers all at once? And how could she relay these prayers to Jesus? She would have to be God to do that. Only Jesus can do that type of thing. But yeah, apparently someone with some beads, they can chant to Mary. Um, and so we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at Mary Olatry uh, in our uh, next um, lesson. Because what I want to do here is not only just go through the verses and just read the scriptures. I want to go through concepts as they come up okay so we can look at um joseph we can look at mary and we can also look at uh christ and what what christ means and some of these might take a while some of them mightn't take long at all but we will go through that and so um let's have a look at what the revised st uh, standard version has in a footnote here so christ um jesus who is called christ christos is the greek translation of the hebrew word messiah meaning anointed one um, so the revised standard version footnote. So in 1952, um, so remember that year, this is the year that a lot of things changed for Bible, Bible versions. In 1952, the revised standard version contained the following blasphemous footnote. Other ancient authorities read Joseph to whom was betrothed the Virgin Mary was the father of Jesus, who is called Christ. Okay. So, other ancient authorities now listen to this he wrote this in 1953 dr alva j mclean so from 1888 to 1968 in the february uh, 28th 1953 issue of the brethren missionary herald pages 137 to 139 he wrote i'll just enlarge in this For this particular piece of skullduggery, not an unfair um, characterization, 
the makers of the revised standard version keep outside the actual virgin birth passage which appears in matthew 1 18 to 25 and centered their attention on verse 16 in both the king james version and the american standard version this verse is translated and jacob be at joseph the husband of mary of whom was born jesus who is called christ and this is exactly what the greek says the revised standard version with its much much publicized antipathy to the verb begat omits this word and puts in three words the father of which have nothing to represent them in the greek but otherwise the verse is left in intact reading in part joseph the husband of mary of whom jesus was born who is called christ in english the pronoun whom is ambiguous and might be singular or plural masculine or feminine but the greek pronoun is singular and feminine pointing clearly to mary alone but consider how very curious uh, how a very curious footnote in which the revised standard version has placed in the margin in connection with verse 16. so i usually read rs when it's rsv i usually read revised standard version rather than rsv because um a lot of people don't know what rsv is so it's like okay revised standard because there's so many bible versions but sometimes i don't know either it's like cib or you know there's so many acronyms um so i'll just say the acronym but if i know it i'll say it out i'll i'll, I'll spell it out this footnote reads as follows other ancient authorities read joseph to whom was betrothed the virgin mary who was the father of jesus who is called christ so was jesus his father joseph now remember this is in the rsv so this is bruce metzger people are like oh bart ehrman he was an orthodox guy you know and and then he just backslid and now he's an atheist you know no 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 he was under bruce metzger who was he's one of the main architects for this this reading of course clearly asserts that joseph was the father of jesus let us examine this specimen of modernistic scholarship so this is in 1953 remember this guy's rebuking this first they say that this reading occurs in other ancient authorities this sounds very impressive but what are these ancient authorities and how many are there well the answer is that there is not even so much as one manuscript in the greek new testament that contains the above reading it is only found in an old version the Sinaitic Syriac discovered in 1892. Second, it should be pointed out that if all the insignificant variant readings which may be found in the ancient versions, um, to say nothing uh, more important of, of the more important ancient manuscripts um, had been included in the footnotes of the RSV New Testament, most of it would be footnotes. As any reader can easily see, very few of these variants are included in the footnotes. Why then, out of the many thousands of variants, did the makers of the RSV put this one in? A reading with almost a complete lack of worthwhile evidence. Again, there is no answer except a stubborn theological bias of the translators against the virgin birth. Third, Worst of all, for the revisers committee, this particular footnote was not in the RSV New Testament, which was published in 1946, but it was slipped into the final product when the entire Bible was published in 1952. So they did a New Testament in 1946, handed it out, and everyone, went, everyone said, wow, this is okay. You know, the critical text guy said, this is fine. Then in 1952, they're like, oh, hang on. This has got these weird readings in it. There's the things changed. It's got footnotes. They're like, we don't like it. <laughs> and, and so they slipped it in. Um, again, one cannot help wondering why it, it happened that way. Um, wondering just why it happened that way. Could it be that the restraint which kept it out of the New Testament in 1946 was the fear of having such a shocking footnote appear on the first page of the book which the readers would meet when they opened the rsv new testament 
certainly it was easier to put into the 1952 publication of the entire RSV Bible after the early 1946 New Testament had been examined critically and when the attention of readers would not be concentrated, sorry, would be concentrated on the Old Testament. So they've done the New Testament, so they're bringing out the Old Testament. Everyone's looking at that, but they've got a different you know, New Testament. They're, they've snuck in other readings, snuck in footnotes. As a matter of fact, its presence was not known to some men who thought that they, uh, what they knew, sorry, I'm trying to read it on a bad angle there. Um, as a matter of fact, its presence was not known to some men who thought they knew what was in the RSV New Testament because they had examined it with great care when, um, when first issued in 1946. A great deal has been made of the so-called willingness of the revisers to make um, suggested changes of any of their work that needs correction, as indicated by some 80 alleged changes made between um, 1946 and 1952 editions of the New Testament. Well, the introduction of this unbelieving and unwarranted footnote is one change which does not agree well for future changes. In 1953, um, Oswald T. Ellis wrote in his critique of the Revised Standard Version of the Old Testament, the Revised Version or Revised Bible, it is important to note this um, connection. I'm just going to have a sip of water here. It is important to note this correction. <clears throat> connection, sorry. That in the New Testament, the Revised Standard Bible, which has introduced a considerable number, page 49, of changes, about 80, in the edition published in 1946, has added a marginal note at Matthew 1.16. Other ancient authorities read, Joseph, to whom was betrothed the Virgin Mary, was the father of Jesus, who is called Christ. This is practically the same as the reading given in the Moffat version. Its main, some would say, is its only clear support is a Sinaitic Syriac manuscript. A palimpsest of about the beginning of the fifth century. Consequently, the statement other ancient authorities read is both vague and misleading. Furthermore, the reading in question is decidedly doubtful since it is self-contradictory. It mentions Mary the Virgin, but also says Joseph begat. That RSV um, used the opportunity of the publication of the completed RSV Bible to insert this footnote at Matthew 116 indicates clear, clearly how little warrant there is for the hope expressed in some quarters that changes can or will be made in the RSV, which will make this version acceptable to evangelical Christians. The, ver the version um, was prepared by liberals, it's owned by liberals, and they will see to it that this hope is not realized. The Revised Version or Revised Bible, a critique of the Revised Standard Version of the Old Testament 1952 by Oswald T. Alice. So when you read through that, you would think, okay, that that's how Will Kinney would write an article or, you know, just, just pointing out the facts. But you can clearly see that there is a diabolical agenda by these people. And so let's have a quick look at the RSV. So... Let's, let's see who was involved with this. The Revised Standard Version is an English translation of the Bible published in 1952 by the Division of Christian Education of the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA. This translation itself is a revision of the American Standard Version, the ASV of 1901, and was intended to be a readable and lit literally uh, accurate literary <laughs> accurate modern English translation, um, which aimed to preserve all 
that is best in an English Bible as it has been known and used throughout the centuries and put and to put the message of the Bible in simple, enduring words that are worthy to stand the great um, Tyndale King James tradition. Well, you don't stand there at all. Um, so what's interesting, Thomas Nelson, we usually go, oh, well, they're the owners of the New King James and, you know, that's been bought out by um, a, a Zondervan who's owned by Murdoch. Um, they published this back in 1901 that all the... the the revised, uh, sorry, the American Standard Version. So the Revised Standard Version is an update of that. So um, so interesting, um, they have these differences. So Isaiah 7.14, there was a dispute there. Instead of having um, the word Alma translated as virgin, they had a young woman um, which which was coming against the virgin birth. Um, and so the controversy stemming from this re rendering helped re reignite the King James only movement within the independent Baptist and Pentecostal churches. Furthermore, many Christians have adopted what is what has come to be known as the Isaiah 714 litmus test, which entails checking that verse to determine whether or not a new translation can be trusted. Okay, so um, Bruce Metzger referring to the pastor who burned the RSV and sent ashes to uh, Wilgie commented in his book, The Bible in Translation. Today, it is um, happily only a copy of the translation that meets such a fate instead of Bible translate translators. So that's what um, Bart Ehrman often uses that. He says, oh, Bruce Metzger, he was given, you know, um, some ashes. So, yeah, someone burnt it. He's like, oh, thank God, they're only burning the Bibles and not the translators nowadays sort of thing. But these guys were just liberals. They weren't like they were full on and they were coming against a corrupt church. They were There was a good church and these guys were liberals. Um, there were good churches coming against these people and making a stand. Um, so the Catholic edition came out in 1965. Um, yay for that. Um, so they also brought out the Apocrypha. Um, so the ESV is based upon that. Um, okay. They did a TV document documentary about the making of the RSV. That's interesting. Bible under fire. Very interesting. I'll have to uh, have to check that one out. Bible under fire. Pfft. A corrupt Bible, which people who were even following the critical texts are like, oh, this is off the wall. Um, so maybe I can see who translated this. That's what I really wanted to do. Okay, so, but we're seeing, you know, Bruce Metzger. RSV, but then we've got the new RSV. Um, maybe I can go back to here. We can look at the translators. Okay, I don't think I'm going to find much about that. So let's just keep going here. So um, I'll just see if there's anything on my site. No, we already read through that. Um, and that was one, was that 116? Yeah. So we did go to 117. So I'll just check 116 in uh, interlinear, unless we've already done that. No, we haven't yet. So we find the bishop says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, that is called Christ. Where Geneva has the and here, and Jacob begat Joseph, ye husband of Mary. So notice they're using ye, not as in uh, plural. 
um, a pluralized uh, pronoun, but it's used as um, a different way of writing the. Um, your husband and Mary, of whom was born Jesus, that is called Christ. Um, here it has even he that is called Christ, that is called Christ, which is called Christ, um, that Jesus, that is called Christ, of whom Jesus was born, that is Clepid Christ. Um, yeah, so pretty much the same thing. So there's really not much to look at there. So let's go to verse 17. And I will jump to the Greek here. Matthew 117. Pasai un hai genai apa Abraham heos David genai deca tesseres. Kai apa David heos tes metroikes. Sias Babylonas genai deca tesseres. Kai apa tes metroikes Babylonas heos tu Christu genai deca tesseres. So we read now, we begin with this un. That's one of those little post-positive particles that will jump second, but we put it first. So, or therefore. So glancing back at this genealogy now and drawing some conclusion. So all the generations from Abraham until David, and then implied are, like Asin or AC, are 14 generations. Notice the Deca for 10, the Tessa, this is uh, 4 and 10, 14. And from David until the deportation of Babylon, until the Babylonian exile, implied again, are 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon until the Christ, implied are again, 14 generations. So we look back and we see the structure 14, 14, 14. Why is this? Well, it seems that Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, employing Jewish literary techniques, is intentionally trying to just put in bold relief a flashing neon sign, David, David, David. Jesus is the Davidic Messiah. You say, how, how is this? Well, think about the Hebrew name David that I've written down here. Uh, the, the first letter of it is Dalit, which is the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And then we have Vav, which is the sixth, and then Dalit again. If we add those up, that's 14. And we know from Jewish interpretation, it's very common to do this with names. Names had numerical value. And uh, it, we also know, if you read commentaries, they'll note if you compare Matthew's genealogy with genealogies from the Old Testament, he's not in any deceptive way, but very intentionally dropped out some generations, which which is sometimes can be done in genealogies. I mean, the first line is Jesus is the son of David, right? That drops out a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of generations in between. But he's intentionally grouped the generations and been selective and and in editing them to emphasize. The Jesus Davidic ancestry and doing that so that it groups into 14, 14, 14. Okay, so um, very interesting. But um, what I would say uh, to that one is <clears throat> uh, my own theory is that Matthew being a tax collector, he would have kept very good records of certain people, um, maybe families, family members, and so perhaps there was a certain way of writing out a genealogy that didn't go right into detail unless those details needed to be known. And so, um, and perhaps the columns that he used, one had 14, yeah, the other one had 14, you know, um, perhaps th that was... Um, part of it where he, he was sort of like okay from one point to the next we're going to put 14 people in there and then he's just sort of putting highlights and so but people get the gist um where i guess you know if we're we're talking about a story um if i was talking about um you know all the translation all the translators who worked on the king james version for example I might just skip through a, a lot of them that we don't know much about or have much information about and just talk about like Lancelot Andrews and other people and and sort of only come up to a number of maybe like 30 where there's a whole 
there's 30 missing, you know, but it's like you you want to just talk about the important things. You you might, you've got that list elsewhere. You can go to the Old Testament and look at all those lists. Uh, he He's not just like, well, I'm just going to copy the Old Testament and that's it. No, he's like, I'm, I'm just making the point here that this is, this is the genealogy. It comes through. We've got this uh, cursed guy in it who no one from his lineage can sit on the throne of David. So obviously Jesus can't be related to his stepfather. Um, so this is not the genealogy of Jesus, it's the genealogy of Joseph. And um, and so perhaps he just had columns of 14. And so th to me that sort of would go, okay, that would fit in a natural sense. I have no way of proving that or, or anything, but if um, that would be something that I would look at if I did further investigation. Um, I, th I think the whole thing of, you know, David adds up to 14 and that's why you got 14, 14. I, I don't, I'm not really sold on that, but perhaps that is true. I'm, I'm open. So, um, so we see Apo from Abraham, Eos, David, um, and so the 14 generations. Um, Pi Apo, David, Eos, Tes, Mentecasius, Babylonos, Gene, Decatesseres. Pi Apo, Tes, Mentecasius, Babylonos, Esto Christu, Gene, Decatesseres. And so you can see this Gene, Decatesseres. So Decatesseres is just a way of saying 14. And so Deca is 10 and Tesseres. Tessa is four, um, and you've got the the four sections um, that occur. So I might have even written about this here. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't got any commentary there, but we'll just read the King James. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon under Christ are 14 generations. In the 2023, it says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon under Christ are 14 generations. So it's pretty much, I think it's saying the, I, it's absolutely identical, I'm pretty sure. Now, when we look at the italics, um, I've followed the italics um verbatim in this verse and many other verses but there are some verses where i haven't because i it's pretty much a consensus that blaney did make some mistakes with the italics and so say for example in 1 john chapter 3 verse 16 where it has of god those italics are totally unwarranted it's in visa it's in scrivener uh the king james has it um not in italics but it's amazing the new king james um, omit those words of god um, thinking, I guess they're in italics, so you don't need them. And um, yeah, it's 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 crazy because it actually that verse is talking about um, uh, the love of um, God um, because He died for us. So saying that God died for us is quite an amazing verse. And so, but they omit that type of thing. Um, I'll quickly go through this and I'll get to, to that comment there about the RSV. So we've got Matthew 117. We'll just see if there's much of a difference here in the bishops. And so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations and from the carrying away into Babylon under Christ are 14 generations. So I'm just checking to see if there's anything it might say carried away or captivity. Um, so the, um, Geneva has carried away. Bishops has carried away. Great Bible, 1539, has captivity of Babylon. Matthews has the captivity of Babylon. Coverdale, captivity. Tyndale, captivity. Wycliffe has the transmigration of Babylon. And the Wessex has the Lior Edenese, whatever that is. But, um, yeah, so that's good. So we've gone to verse 17. Now, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to keep sort of studying through. And what I might do 
is okay so we looked at the greek so we don't need that anymore we don't need these greek diagrams i'll keep that one open for a little bit of interest and we have looked at that so i will get to this uh, comment here helg says the, four, uh, the 1946 Revised Standard Version New Testament is in fact a little better than the final product when the whole Bible was completed in 1952 and later editions. And the, uh, the New Revised Standard Version went further and today's New Revised Standard Version User Edition is the Woke Bible. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. They've got Jennifer Nust um, as the principal editor. And if you look up who Jennifer Nust is, she is like Bud Ehrman, but um, woke. And and yeah, for the LBGT uh, community, she um, basically says that homosexuality is not even mentioned in the Bible. So why would people get upset about it? It's fine to be homosexual um, and all that, and the Bible doesn't speak against it. And that's what she says. She says she's the main principal editor of the Bible. <laughs> so th this is where it's headed. So this is the, you know, Bart Ehrman, he is part of this whole crew, um, knows these people, and um, people are like, well, he was just a conservative scholar who, who's just gone astray. Or he actually read the Bible and realised how wrong it was. It's like, no, no, no. He, he was liberal to the back teeth and then thought, man, I can make some money. Or I can do a Dan Brown here. Because um, he actually wrote against the Da Vinci Code, and I think that triggered his thought to like, actually, people are really interested in this. I could come out and be the guy who's, you know, defecting and write all the dirty little secrets about the Bible, you know, and and everyone will buy my books. And if you tune into any of his videos that he's done lately, he is like, you don't have to pay two hundred and fifty dollars to go to our conference. It's only sixty dollars, yay! You know, and he's got people you know, all around the world, um, jumping on his programs and doing courses and going to Bible conferences and stuff like that. He is just, he's become like the, the Kenneth Copeland of atheists. <laughs> and atheists just hold up the card and go, yeah, but Bart Ehrman. And I'm like, and I, I, I usually type, yeah, he's, he's not that good. They're like, he's the world's leading scholar. And you're saying he's not that good. It's like, who says he's the world leading scholar? There's so much he doesn't know. There's so much he blunders about that even critical text guys are left there like scratching their head going, what, what's he saying now? Like, oh, there's no Byzantine readings in the early church. It's like, what are you talking about? Of course there is. And so anyway, that's Bart Ehrman. So um, I'm just going to check some things. And I won't be a sec because I had a whole page written out here of things that I wanted to get to. Okay, so maybe we'll look at that. <clears throat> so Matthew um, 1, 1 to 13. So I've only done 1 to 13 there. But it has Sinaiticus reads, a sack instead of Isaac. Um, 1.3, B, Vaticanus, reads Zare instead of Zara. 1.4, Aleph reads Aminadab correctly the first time when it's written, but Aminadam the second time. B, Aleph and P1 reads Boaz against diverse opposition favoring Boaz. Nevertheless, the United Bible Society compilers adopted Boaz. Um, one five, um, B and L, so B and Aleph, um, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And some Alexandrian allies read Yobed instead of Obed. Um, 33 Yobed. Um, verse six, Aleph reads Solomon in, instead of S Salomona. Um, one six, B reads Urion instead of Orion, Oriu, sorry, Uriu instead of Uriu. <laughs> uh, one seven, Aleph reads Abia, Abias instead of Abia, Abia. One eight, B and Aleph read Azian instead of 
Ozian. One nine Aleph reads Akaz, Akaz instead of Akaz, Akaz. One ten to eleven B and Aleph read Usian, Usian instead of Usian, Usias. Uh, one twelve and thirteen B reads uh, Salathia, Salathiel instead of Salathiel. In addition to reading Gena instead of Agenison three times, one thirteen um, Sinaiticus reads Aboit instead of Abiud. So Abiud instead of Abiud. Okay, that's interesting because that would mean that that could be evidence that um, Sinaiticus was dictated <coughs> or just copied from a bad manuscript or just a mistake. Uh, experts for the reading in 1.5. Um, these readings disagree with both the United Bible Society's NA compilation and with the Robertson Pierpont 2005 Byzantine text. This shows a high level of variation in the spelling of proper names in the Alexandrian text stream. Okay, so then it goes on about the Asaf issues. Um, Okay, so then we have some of Scott Jones's material, which I don't really need to go through. Um, and then Will Kinney is just pointing out some of the similar things that we've talked about about just going back to, you know, the Old Testament, and you can see the correct names, which matches up to Matthew. But if you've got the critical text, it doesn't match up. Um, yeah, and then the interesting uh, NA 27th edition, it has, and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served uh, as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. This marks a significant step with regard to interconfessional relationships. How nice, how lovely, and heretical. Um, okay, so what else have I got here? Um, One sixteen. Okay, so I've got quite a lot written here. The Asa issue, Amon. The Beget Jeconias, we looked at that. It's just giving you all the manuscripts that have it and don't. Um, Jeconias, Jeconiah. Jehoiakim. And I don't think there's much else. Okay, that was all um, some very technical stuff. Now, I'll tell you, if you want to do some more study on this and go through it, this is um, Gavin McGrath books. So I'll, I'll put this into the comment section. Now, he's done a commentary on the Texas Receptus, and so I often go there and get some information. Now, some of this information can be, you know, 10 years old, and he's constantly um, going through the New Testament. But um, you can see here he'll talk about Asa, and he'll, he'll have quite a lot to say about that, and he'll talk about manuscript evidence and, um, and things pretty much exactly what I've said and then Amon or Amos, the begat issue. Um, so 
sometimes he does talk about other issues, but mostly in his commentary on the TR, he does stick with the text. Um, and sometimes, too, what I do with these is I actually um, put it into an audio format and listen to it. If you can handle listening to a robot. Okay, so then he's got... these issues of Joseph and Mary. Okay, and then it goes to verse 18. So there's quite a lot there if you want to go through it. Um, the RSV, Moffat, these deny, um, deny these fundamentals of Christian faith. So he's talking about the RSV issue. Um, but we covered most of that. But if you want to get more details, or you want to look at the manuscript evidence, go to that PDF. Okay. Okay, so I'm just wondering if there's anything else I really need to do. Maybe what I can do is I'll just jump back up to Matthew 1. Okay, so we've gone through now to verse 17. Now, I do want to just jump back to um, Joseph and Mary, and we want to look at these two because um, they have been idolized to the point where, um, yeah, sometimes when someone is idolized, we can have a wrong impression of who they are and, um, and their importance. I understand that they are important people by bringing uh, Mary, bringing Christ into the world and Joseph looking after Mary and looking after Jesus. But um, sometimes we can give people an overinflated um, sense of importance uh, like the Roman Catholics do with Mary and start chanting to her and um, you know, thinking that they can do a rosary bead and count how many times they say Hail Mary, full of grace. And, and with Joseph, you know, as well, there, there are some issues with him and so knowing the extremes we can check ourselves and say do i have those type of extremes in my life and um, that really helps us with our own um, theology sometimes some churches they have uh, an infatuation with mary that's unwarranted but some people also go the other way and they overreact and they don't respect mary like we if we were to talk about um you know john the, the, the Apostle John, we would say, wow, what a guy, you know, and we, we would talk uh, highly of someone like that. But sometimes when Mary's brought up, we only think of, you know, the Roman Catholic Mary. So we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater and we think, oh, let's not focus on her. But what we really need, need to do is get a um, biblical understanding of who Mary is, what she did, and Joseph, and anyone who has been exalted above measure. Um, exalted to the point where they have, like Mary's been given God-like status. Um, Joseph is just one of those dead saints who you can ch chat to. So not good to talk to the dead. Talk to the living. Jesus is alive. He is um, forevermore um, going to answer your um, prayers, going to um, talk with you, going to help you. Uh, Mary is dead. She will be um, resurrected. Um, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first, and we that are, are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And so um, you know, the day that she um, that she passed away, you know, she um, entered into a place called eternity, and it will be a very quick moment for her, and she will um, be resurrected into and see the face of Christ. Now, I think she would be shocked um, to think that people are chatting to her, chanting to her. and uh, But then there is another extreme where people seem to think that any type of old portrait of a mother with a baby is pagan. <laughs> and it's quite interesting. When you read through Matthew chapter 2, it does say the wise men came in and they saw the child with his mother, and they bowed down and worshipped him. So can you imagine 
Jesus sitting with Mary. Um, and you've got the perfect picture of, you know, the, the Madonna with the baby sort of thing. And um, people are like, oh, it's a pagan thing. See, pagan cultures always had a, you know, this, this mother and, and the baby. And, and it's like, uh, <laughs> what were you doing when you were a little baby? <laughs> you were doing that too. And me too. We were all doing that. So something so common, you can't really say, oh, it's just the pagans have rights to that. You know what I mean? It's probably just, a, you know, people have just got a very normal thing of a, a mother and child. They're worshiping Jesus. It says they worship Jesus, not her. Okay. So she's there like, yeah, well, he's worthy of worship. And um, and people have, you know, created statues, don't you know, done pictures, whatever they've done, gone a bit overboard with it. Now they're you know chatting to the woman. Um, but yeah, I, I think something like that is just a normal, natural part of life that most mothers and we all went through that, unless you were, you know, uh, adopted or you, you had some sort of problem with milk or but you know, most people 90 percent of people have that and so to have this whole concept that it's a pagan thing no i think the ancient world just went hey look look at what my mum's doing she's feeding you know brother number two and maybe drew a picture of it and made a clay statue it's like it's a very natural normal thing you know so to just say that that type of thing is regulated to pagan worship, I think I think that's just ridiculous. But so we're going to go th through that. But then it's pretty exciting what we're going to go through. So we're going to, um, I I think verse seventeen sort of is the cutting off point for all the um, genealogical issues. Now, if we have to revisit that, we will. But I don't think at this time we have to. So then we're going to go through um, from verse 18 to verse 25. And so um, that will be interesting too, because a lot of Bibles actually skip the whole um, genealogical thing. Like say the Lindisfarne Gospels, they start here, the birth of Jesus Christ. And so um, it's like the RHO, the Christ, uh, is, is usually big on the Lindisfarne Gospels. And um, it's a very interesting document. Um, now, the birth of Jesus was on this wire, so it talks about um, Mary and Joseph before they came together. So we're going to be looking at the perpetual virginity of Mary, um, which the Roman Catholics claim, the Orthodox claim. Um, we're going to talk about how, how many children Jesus had. And also in this section, it clearly says um, that and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. So he eventually did know her. Uh, this seems to be the most shocking thing to Catholics. It's like, what? How can Joseph ever touch the virgin? You know, it, it's as if she gave birth to a son and then um, yeah, they never had any type of relations with each other. And, and yeah, it's just this strange type of concept. Um, but we see he's also called the firstborn son, which is omitted in modern Bibles. It just has brought forth a son. So, oh, she could have had other sons, you know. And there's a whole story that the um, there was a Roman soldier called Pantera who um, had sex with Mary and, you know, these type of blasphemous type of stories. So we're going to go through um, this type of thing. And also what we want to do too is we don't want to drop out in any of the details because there was a dream that happened here. The Lord appeared to him in a dream. So we're going to be looking at the subject of dreams. Um, we're going to be looking at, at the virgin birth. Um, and we're going to be looking at Jesus saving his people from their sins. What does that mean? Um, we're looking at the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. So this is... We're going to be looking at that particular prophecy that occurs in Isaiah. And also there is a an issue with the Texas Receptus, um, the difference between um, and they shall call his name or um, or she shall call his name or his name shall be called. Um, so we're going to look at those issues in the um, text of Beza and Scrivener. That's uh, a textual variant in the TR Ish, um, Tia um, editions between um, Beza and Scrivener. Uh, looking at God with us, what does that mean? Um, 
and yeah so we will there's quite a lot in this um from verse 18 to verse 25 so we'll try to get through it as quick as we possibly can but we don't want to just rush through and miss things and so um we'll go through all that and we'll we'll check those out and we'll see what we can learn from that so we've got Helg um, has says, Mary is an example of great humility. And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Yes, handmaid means female servant. A doule, um, curio, female servant. Very interesting. Very nice. And so... Um, yeah, and that would be in contrast to Zechariah, the father of um, John the Baptist. Yeah, he was like, how can this be? And it's like, well, we're old people. It's, uh, it can't happen. And he's like, look, I stand in front of God. You know, you're supposed to be a priest praying to God. And you, well, you don't even believe that this can happen. It's like you're, you're going to be mute. So he couldn't talk or anything. It's quite an amazing story. I love reading through that. And it's, it's a shame that probably only at Christmas time we sort of, you know, go through those ones. Or um, I, I really enjoy um, those biblical narratives. Yeah, so um, I'm pretty excited about going through this. Now, I'm not sure when I will do the next uh, Matthew 1 TR edition um, because I've got quite a lot of... Um, sizzling away in the in the corners of uh, youtube world and different studies and so i'm still doing my eschatology studies uh on tommy mcmurtry um stephen anderson um yeah, ken hovine and a bunch of other people from the ifb or new ifb um and people who are against the pre-trib rapture and so we're going to be looking at those type of videos and i'm going to just continue doing that as a side project um, but also, um, I, I am in the middle of doing the 190 list of Scrivener. So I'll continue to do that. Also, I want to every now and then bring up a video that has to do with the Comiohenium and the evidence for the Comiohenium. And so I've, I think I've done about 15 videos on that so far. So if you do want to know about the comma, I've got a playlist there that you can go through, which has quite a lot of material on that. And also, I am uh, still going through the Thomas Ross, James White uh, debate. And I'll be glad when I get that one finished because there are a lot of other debates that I really want to go through. See, I haven't even gone through um, the debates of Jeff Riddle and James White, and I'd love to go through those. And, um, you know, some of the older videos like Jeff Riddle and Stephen Boyce uh, and even the, uh, the chat that um, Peter Gurry uh james snap jr and um who else was there uh yeah that that's also um uh just trying to remember the guy's name who ran that uh it's really sad that i've, I've forgotten his name because i was actually pretty good friends with him on facebook but uh, i just haven't um what's his name anyway I hate I hate it when people do that. They're like, was it a Tuesday or a Wednesday? And they're like, oh, I think it was a Tuesday. They're in the middle of something. It's like, it doesn't matter if it's Tuesday or Wednesday. Just, just move on. Okay, so I'm going to finish it there, guys. Thanks for joining us. And we'll continue. Um, we'll go back to verse 16. We'll revisit verse 16. We'll look at Joseph and Mary. And then after that, we're going to go through from verse 18. So that might be the episode after. But we'll just see what we can squeeze into that um what else have i got to say maybe um maybe i'll shut that down let's just have a look at what else we've got here might just quickly go to youtube i'll just show you what was done this morning so there was so I've subscribed to these guys, the Baptist Bias, just because they have, um, I guess, they're the new IFB guys, and they'll be talking about, you know, um, Stephen Anderson and what he thinks and Tommy McMurtry. See, I, I'm totally out of the loop with that, 
and um, you know some of these people to not know that Tommy McMurtry has sided with Matt first and you know that, that he's getting his eschatology from him now and he's dropped the 70th week of Daniel prophecy and these guys are, are doing studies on you know, some people that's their life and that's what they follow and, and uh, to me it's like a big storm in a teacup but I do want to know why people have moved from certain positions and why Tommy McMurtry was lined up with these guys and now he's not. And, um, you know, the ramifications of that, has he been booted from their fellowship? I don't know. No one's really helping me from their side of it. But um, but it is interesting that this um, whole video that was played this morning is actually the debate that I had with Tommy McMurtry. And so I'd encourage you to go there and view it. Uh, you mightn't be happy that I'm a pre-trip guy but I'm trying my best to understand their position, to go through it. And, yeah, that's um, one of the reasons why I watched The Baptist Bias because Jeff Riddle was on there. And so what I find is these um, new IFB guys, they're pretty smart in how they advertise things. Um, you look at uh, Stephen Anderson you know, getting on the Alex Jones show. and He doesn't say, hey, Alex, I think you're off the wall believing in reptilians and blah, blah, blah. Um, he sort of just, he will just go, yes, yes, Alex Jones, Alex Jones, and, and not rebuke him. And, and, um, he gets popular by, by doing that. He, he sort of knows how to use the modern day media for his advantage and to propagate, you know, his church and his teachings and things like that. And I sort of did feel like they've got Jeff Riddle on there, but they really, they want to scream at a Calvinist sort of thing. And, um, but you know that they went through it because they've got a, a new video on, about the Bible that they want to push and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I can't, I've, you know, the, I know a lot of these people are in the Texas Receptors Academy as well. And so I don't want to distance them either because what I've noticed is when you go through, say, the James White, um, uh, Stephen Anderson uh, chat that they had for like two and a half hours. It was quite amazing that um, his bibliology, and I was, I was coming against the whole concept that Jesus burnt in hell because that's only like a King James kooky, King James sort of concept where it's, it's, you can't get that from, um, from any other Bible, really. It's, it's, it's an English is, issue. And so uh, I was sort of proving that, and it's, it's amazing how far he's come from that time but he still has to hold on to these doctrines because he's you know or half of the half of his doctrines are really if he studied the way that he actually teaches to study he would disprove himself you know if he really was tr you know he he wouldn't ever get that doctrine from the just the texas receptors you know he gets it from the king james bible by only defining hell as um a place of burning and not defining hell as you know, having the the societal concept of hell, which was a, a, a cell, a hidden place, uh, equivalent to Sheol, equivalent to Hades. Um, he's saying, oh, it's only got one definition, that's the burning hell, you know. And so um, having that, which I believe in a burning hell, eternal um, torment and everything, and that Hades, that burning hell gets thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever, the smoke of their torment rises up, you know, I believe in all that. But... Um, yeah, so I was looking at that, but then when you look today that these guys are actually trying to get out of that type of um, you know, ignorant type of Ruckmanite um, posture where, where it's just like, well, they're just, they're just misusing um, uh, words. They're, they're, re, they're, they're defining terms in 1611 with modern terms and um, they're not really um properly defining their terms and so uh kept here in all ages christian mcshaffrey is in the house yes that was an excellent discussion yeah i really enjoyed that and it was good to hear that's why i thought maybe i should go back through some of these debates that jeff riddles had because you forget how good they were uh and james white just saying i, I would change any verse according to the evidence and it's like um and Jeff Riddle in that discussion saying that was worse than what Bart Ehrman, but Bart Ehrman was saying that the orthodox scribes had corrupted it, you know, or refixed it or whatever. But he's just saying, um, like, 
the last 12 verses of Mark a, a Gnostic. I remember when he said that, it was like, what? Um, you just sort of picture James White, like James White being worse in some places than Bart Ehrman. But I think the problem is with James White, he postures himself in a certain direction to combat one argument and then he postures himself in another direction to combat another argument. And sometimes this causes him to contradict himself um, because he's just trying to win a debate. And so um, people people just have to go through two or three of his debates and they're like, well, you were saying to this guy this, but now you're saying that. It's, it's contradictory. But he seems to now contradict himself just in the middle of a debate. But it doesn't seem to matter. He's got his fanboys who just go, yay, in the middle of a debate or he just pulls a funny face or just... Yeah, crosses his arms and says, this is ridiculous. And everyone goes, oh, he's won, you know. Um, Helg says, the preserved Bible is quite good. It's done from the new IFV perspective, but still. Yeah, so um, one of the things is, I guess, um, you know, these guys immediately think I'm, I'm not a Christian. Uh, and that's just what they default to. It's like, okay, Nick says he's not a Christian. Oh, I didn't realize he's not a Christian. You know, just not saved at all. Um, and so I, I guess I'm just sort of getting used to that. I, I was pretty used to the Ruckmanites when I started running the um, Exposing Peter Ruckman Facebook page and had yeah threats. I had people saying that I committed sin because I hadn't married a white person. <laughs> it was pretty wild. But then you had a whole bunch of other people saying, look, look, I used to be involved with Ruckmanism and I, I know what he taught about black people. I know what he taught about, um, you know, Jews and Asians being, you know, superior people and black blacks are at the bottom and whites aren't at the top. It's not white supremacy because they're just sort of in the middle, you know, sort of thing. And, you know, this, this amazing type of um, racial structure that he, that he has. I mean, can you imagine someone with the intelligence of, um, like, say, even though he's an SDA, like Ben Carson, um, like standing next to Ruckman and Ruckman saying, well, you, you're just like this honky um, you know, jigaboo standing by the log. You know, you can't, you can't do anything unless a whitey tells you what to do and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, hey, the, you know, if you know the story of, of someone like Ben Carson and how he... Um, his mother, you know, really helped him to get out of a ghetto mentality and to to become a guy who did the first hemispherectomy brain surgery. I mean, it, he's a brilliant guy. And, you know, he eventually ended up uh, working for Trump. I have no idea how that went. Um, might have gone south. It might have gone well. But, uh, but he is a smart guy. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, if the... NIFB is now inviting Calvinists onto their podcast. You might be okay, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I was like, am I that bad? You know, um, and I guess that's one of the things where when you look at James White and his influence on these people, he's really had zero influence on them except to irate them and um, yeah, make them think th that James White's an absolute hypocrite and they've pointed that out. And it's quite easy to point out where James White's wrong. But when you look at, say, Taylor DeSoto and Dane Johansson, they sort of went alongside... Like, like he's, you know, a guy labelled America's hate preacher, right? And people liked him because he was you know, patriotic, you know, got tased and all that. And, you know, and he would say a whole bunch of stuff where people are like, yeah, you know... But sometimes we do create heroes out of people who just state the obvious. Like Ben Shapiro says, a woman is a woman. And we're like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's pretty much stuff that we believe anyway, you know, but it's some people in some circles aren't saying it. So he's sort of coming out. But then the problem is with Anderson, he goes too far. And it's like, you know, homosexuals can't even be saved and all this stuff. It's like, where are you getting this? Obama should be shot. <laughs> It's like, what, where, where are you getting this, you know? So, um, but yeah, at least um, that, that's, I take my hat off to um, Taylor DeSoto and Dania Hansen. Like they influenced um, uh, Anderson to be confessional. Uh, and, and I would say that probably one of the strongest um, 
one of the strongest positions that I, I've definitely learned from, from Jeff Riddle and uh, Theodore Letus and you know, reading through um, e even you know, Christian McShaffrey, who's in the chat here, and, uh, and lots of other people who have been involved with that, um, I've definitely learned a lot um, looking at those arguments, looking at Edward Hill's arguments. And so um, it seems that that has been the position that... Um, that Stephen Anderson has adopted. And see, the thing is, if Stephen Anderson adopts it, all the others underneath him adopt it. And so I think that's one of the things. If I can uh, convince, um, you know, Stephen Anderson of being a pre-trib guy, <laughs> imagine that. He's just like, yeah, I've adopted Nick Say's uh, pre-tribulational stance. And it's like uh, you'd have like 32 churches automatically change. and Because it's funny, like I was involved with a church where we had a very strong charismatic leader in the United States. And he started, I think it was like um, 3,000 churches around the world. And so, but people, when he had a mustache in the 1970s, every every preacher had a mustache. You know, if he wore a suit and tie, they all wore a suit and tie. If he drove a certain car, they would be like, oh, we, we should really, you know, they just, the whole discipleship thing was like, we've got to be like the pastor, you know. And so it's it's kind of funny when I look at these new IFB guys, I can just yeah, usually they've got the same sort of type of background thing. Like it's either a you know, wooden background or, a, um, you know, a, a picture of a, a painting or something like that. It's it's just, a, a, it's like, oh, the background and it's sort of like a haircut thing and the way they dress and the way they talk. It, it's like all these combined, you sort of just, you can just see, oh, Anderson, 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 and Anderson. Now, I understand people who we look up to and gravitate towards, we usually emulate. And, um, yeah, I'm sure that people could, from America, could come to Australia, they could look at me and look at certain pastors that I've sat under and go, you're exactly like this other guy. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not, you know. And I remember one time, praying i was asked to pray in a service and i prayed i was a brand new christian and someone came up to me and said are you from america and it's just that the whole church used to pray like americans because we had so many american pastors come over and preach for us that we'd be like hallelujah yeah amen and, and not even realizing we're doing it it's just um if you're hanging around the bros and you're like hey bro you you start talking like that if you, you you're talking to people I used to hang around lots of Greeks in Melbourne and you start talking like this, mate, and you, you get a real accent to you and um, you, you hang around Israelis and, and they've got a different way of speaking. You end up with a bit of a twang. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. But he has a lot of sway over those new IFB guys and they're, that is a very popular movement and they are very evangelistic. And so um, as much as... You might enjoy the fact that they're getting um, more and more popular. They are going to explode because they are evangelizing. A lot of other groups aren't. So they're creating um, disciples who are, you know, going door to door and saying, hey, you're saved. I mean, if you can sort of be once saved, always saved, you go to these churches and you're not really that judged. You just sort of, oh, oh well, I've, I've, I'm backslidden. I'm doing whatever I want. Um it's, you know, there, there is a lot of wiggle room there. And so anyway, that's my, my rant. Um, Helg says, uh, Jeff Riddle is not afraid to appear on podcasts, which represent other views. Kudos to him. Many shy away from that. Yeah. I thought it was, um, at first I was like, oh man, he's sort of giving these guys popularity. And then I thought, man, these guys are already very popular. You know, I think if anything, Jeff shows these guys that the Texas Receptus position is intelligent. Um, if if they um, continue to study these things out, they'll be able to articulate their position in a, a better way than has been before in, say, what would be labelled the old IFB. Uh, and even Jeff Riddle said, look, I, I take my hat off to some of these people who stuck by the king james but maybe for the wrong reasons but the, the, at the end they had the, the right reason to because they just felt something was wrong but they didn't have the, the all the correct information there and and that's the thing at the end of the day if the worst of the worst you know the the worst ruckmanite that was to come into your church and preach if 
Peter Ruckman preached in your church the gospel, if Gail Ripplinger came in and did a sermonette, um, if um, Sam Gipp goes in it, I mean, you're pretty much going to hear stuff that's, you know, 90% of it's like, yeah, 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 that's fine. Who would you rather, them or Bruce Metzger, Carlo Martini, Bart Ehrman? Um, you know, half of these guys are just whacked. Uh, and these are the main guys. And so, yeah, underneath them, you might get a few guys who, you know, they know the gospel and all the rest of it, but they're looking toward these gurus, learning from them, learning all their mistakes. And so anyway, yeah, so um, I, but I did notice that Tommy McMurtry, he did a, um, on his spirit of prophet. So you've got um, this one here, the spirit of prophecy one. So has done more to this is our debate that we did um, the other day or just a while back. And so what I found Tommy did is he did a an expose of someone um, <clears throat> who had a pre-trib position and he invited him on the show. And so I was thinking, oh, maybe I can go on his show. Now, I, I wouldn't expect that much would come from that. And I know that Probably out of everything. See, most people they enjoy what I talk when I talk about the Bible, when I talk about bibliology, they they enjoy it, they love it, they get ideas and they're like, oh, that's a good way of saying or or whatever. And I do listen to a lot of stuff on that. So I get lots of different opinions and I read a lot of books on that. And sometimes I've got a few little secret sources that um no no one really knows about. And I, I dig into it and Scott Jones is one of those and and even how I was showing you, uh, Gavin McGrath, he's got a lot of really interesting information. And so I'll bring a lot of that out, and people haven't heard that before. So I guess that's why they, they tune in. But when it comes to eschatology, there's so many different opinions. And, you know, you can get people who are um, post-trib, pre-wrath, who aren't one saved, always saved, hating against um pre-tribbers and it's like who who are once saved always saved and it's, it's just there's all these different groups and and um but yeah I, i'm going to continue to go down that hole i know a lot of people really don't want me to and um like i said usually when i do an eschatology video i get like one or two viewers and it's like it's pretty sad but um but i'm going to continue to do the um texas receptor stuff bringing out a, a, um, light upon the darkness of modern versions coming against um, the corruption. And I, th I was thinking too, when I was li listening to the Jeff Riddle interview, some of the information that we brought out, like with Georgios Babiniotis, with um, the, the grammatical issue of 1 John 5, 7, I mean, that just smashes um that whole concept that the comiohanium shouldn't be in the bible it smashes that out, out of the ballpark then we've got the issue of um revelation 16 5 i mean i think that's that's been laid to rest i mean you may as well say goodbye to that one uh, i was surprised surprised that james white actually brought that up in the um thomas ross debate there's there's a few things that i would really love to um go more into what would be really good is to actually do a regular shows on this book. I think that'd be good. Like maybe like a Saturday night thing. It's like, okay, the King James only controversy. And, you know, we've, we've sort of read a few, you know, pages and, and talking about um, this book and going chapter by chapter. I wouldn't legally be able to read chapter by chapter, but I think that, um, I think that we we could all benefit from going through this. Now, I know Stephen Anderson did a bit of a series where he just sort of say, okay, in chapter 80 says this, this and that. But there were some things where I was, I, I wanted to hear what he said about Revelation 16.5, but he didn't really, he just sort of said, oh, it sounds right. So let's move on, you know, which to me isn't really something that would convince someone on the other side. Um, but yeah, that would be an interesting thing to go through. So um, but also, I want to do more on Bart Ehrman because Bart Ehrman is getting um, away with what he's getting away with. And we want to expose him as just um, basically uh, Bruce Metzger Jr., but with uh, an appetite for money. He's just making a fortune off what he's doing. 
So anyway, I'm going to go, guys. So Techmeister says kudos for that um, Texas receptor stuff. Yeah, there's more coming. So um, the only translation to be considered mainstream. The received text received in all ages. Metzger Jr. Yeah. <laughs> People think Metzger was, uh, you know, the guru of um, of the Bible. He might have known a little bit of stuff, but um, these guys were absolutely heretical and pointed out by even critical text people were saying uh, this Bible was heretical that Bruce Metzger worked on. And so um, anyway, guys, I've gone for nearly three hours here, so I'm going to bail, but God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining.